and then go back to the screen share. Okay. So welcome if you're joining us on the recorded version. Uh, we're just starting taking a look through this uh, constitutional quiz or a guided tour workbook of the Book of Confessions and the Book of Order. So um, who convened the council that wrote the Nicene Creed? Who was that? Constantine. And in what year? 325 AD. Yep. Okay. And the Trinitarian pattern of the Apostles' Creed was created to be used in the liturgy of which sacrament? Baptism. Baptism. Yeah, y'all remember we talked about that um, earlier. Uh, according to the Scots Confession, what, or rather who, is the cause of the good works that we do? Uh, who would be Oprah? <laughs> no? <laughs> the other one. Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Or the Spirit um, of Jesus, actually, I think is uh, how. Yeah, the Lord Jesus the Lord, Christ. The Lord Jesus, yeah. That's the same person. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this one we know a little bit, um, the, um, maybe. Um, we actually have adapted some of the language from this portion of the Scots Confession into our affirmation of faith each year on the Kirkland of the Tartan Sunday. So it might be maybe slightly familiar, but according to uh, the Scots Confession, what are the three notes of the true Kirk? True preaching of the word of God. All right, that's one. The right, oh, I can't read that. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> the right administration. The right administration of the sacraments of Jesus. Ecclesiastical discipline, uprightly ministered, yeah. whereby vice is repressed and virtue nourished. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the big three are word, sacrament, and discipline, all right? So those are kind of the, the summaries of that. Um, so this was right in an era of the Reformation. You said, well, we want to do things the right way. Right. If we see, or if a lot of the reformers said, we see problems in the way that uh, the medieval church is doing things. Um, then how do you how do you know if you're doing things right? What what counts as the 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 correct way to do things? And so different reformers came up with their own uh, uh, ways of discussing the right uh, or, or true marks of the true church. Uh, Calvin had two in his descriptions. It was the first two, the, the word um, and, and sacraments, both being done, you know, right. And then um, others uh, in that same thread came along and added the third discipline. I'm looking real quick, uh, trying to remember in, um, if it's the Scots Confession that says it or um, The da, 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 da. all right, where was it? Okay, yeah. So the Scots Confession, the first one is the true preaching of the Word of God. Uh, and another document, I think the Second Helvetic Confession, which borrows from Calvin, uh, they, they tweak that just a little bit and they say the right preaching and hearing of the Word of God, right? So it's an emphasis not just on what the preacher says, but also on. How do we hear the word of God in worship, which has implications for Christian education and uh, lifelong discipleship? Okay, the three parts of the Heidelberg Catechism are what? Part one, two, and three. Misery. Misery. Redemption. Redemption of the Father. Gratitude. Thankfulness. Yeah. Okay, so man's misery, redemption, and gratitude, right? So, so in a way, right, that's that prayer of confession, and then assurance of pardon, and then, in our church at least, the offering, right, responding in gratitude and thanksgiving for God's grace. But that's, that's the structure. So of those, what part, in which of those three parts, does the Ten Commandments come up? Thankfulness. Yeah, part three, which is, uh, so this was uh, something that set uh, Calvin and, and the Calvinist um, Protestants off somewhat different from the Lutherans when they talked about the law, that is the Old Testament laws, but also broadly the, 
the responsibility of living a Christian life. Um, what's the purpose of the law? Luther said the main purpose of the law is to show us how bad we are, right? You read the Ten Commandments and you realize, I, I don't fully measure up. Not just the Ten, but the full law, right? Uh, love God and love neighbor. I don't, I don't do that every day, every breath, right? So, so uh, Luther understood the main use or main purpose of the law to be to convict us of our sin, right? We're held up. It, it's, some, it's, it's often called the negative use of the law. Calvin, on the other hand, talked about the positive use of the law. He said, yes, we learn how we sin, but the, the whole point of the law is to, uh, in response to God's grace, the law guides us in living uh, a virtuous, loving, serving life, right? We, we love God and love neighbor, not just to, rem we're not, we don't just hear that command or the, the twofold a great two commandments or the Ten Commandments to tell us how bad we are, but also to give us something to aim for, to, to direct our response and our gratitude. So we haven't been doing it during online worship, um, but, you know, in our normal pre-COVID era, you know, it's, we, we sing the Ten Commandments and worship, borrowing that idea from Calvin, but it's not just that we do it, but specifically when we do it that theologically matters, right? We confess our sins, we hear the good news of grace, and in response to the good news, we sing our intention to follow the commandments or the law um, in that, that gratitude, that thankfulness. So that's Calvin's, uh, theologians will talk about Luther's negative use of the law and Calvin's positive use of the law. So that's, um, and that just that little bit is, is reflected structurally in the Heidelberg Catechism. Okay, uh, who wrote the second Helvetic Confession and in what city was he? Bullinger mm -hmm. in Zurich. Heinrich Bullinger, that's right. So uh, you remember back to our, our uh, talk about Presbyterian history. We said, you know, the first uh, theologian in the Reformed tradition who, who came before John Calvin was that guy Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli was the pastor and theologian in Zurich. And when Zwingli died, uh, Heinrich Bullinger took over. Uh, he was one of his students, and he became his successor. Uh, Heinrich Bullinger, or as my, uh, my theology professor at Columbia Seminary used to call him, Hammer and Hank Bullinger. So, <laughs> you could make that joke in Atlanta, maybe easier than, than other seminaries. But um, All right, uh, chapter 10. What, last week, Two weeks ago, when we talked about Reformed theology, we spent a lot of time on the doctrine of election or predestination. And I mentioned at the end, this 10th chapter of the Second Helvetic Confession is a great place to get um, some full, rich, historically informed, but also still very modernly re relevant, I think, language about how we talk about this confusing and important doctrine. So um, in that confession, um, in, uh, there's the question about whether people are, who, who's good enough to be included in election, right? Who's good enough to be included in God's grace? And in response, Heinrich Bullinger says, let blank be the looking glass or the mirror in whom we may contemplate our predestination. Christ. 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 Right. So when you're wondering, am I good enough to, to make it, to be included in God's grace? The answer is no. None of us are good enough on our own. Right. You don't look in the mirror and see your own imperfections. Instead, when you're asking and wondering and doubting these, you look in the mirror and you see Christ, Christ who is good enough, um, more than good enough. And that's how we are included in God's grace. All right, according to the Westminster Confession, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is what? Scripture itself. Scripture, scripture itself. itself, right? So we don't just, uh, that means when we come across parts of the Bible that are confusing and we seek to make sense of them, the first place we start in trying to interpret is to read other parts of the Bible as guides, Right? So, so it's this reminder not to just proof text and lift out little bits that we like, but to keep the whole of the biblical witness, the full teachings of Scripture together 
in mind as we seek to, to make sense and to parse out um, uh, this. So um, we could go into more details on examples of that, but, but for the sake of time, we'll keep moving through. <laughs> Um, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, sacraments are wholly blank and blank of the covenant of grace. Signs and seals. Yeah, signs and seals. So a sign, remember, uh, of course, is something that represents or points to something that is not itself, right? So an exit sign on the interstate points you to the actual road that is the exit, but the sign is not the exit in and of itself. You can't drive on that, you know, uh, up and down green piece of metal, um, you, it, it's a sign that points you to something else. So um, in receiving the sacrament of the Lord's Supper or baptism, for in instance, we don't receive God's grace from the physical water. Rather, it's a sign that points us to God's grace that is there already right? In the same way, it's a seal, seal meaning the, the uh, like a royal seal, the, the, the stamp that would be put on uh, documents and uh, centuries past to say, this is, this is real, this is official, this is confirmed to be true, right? Signs and seals of grace. According to, to the shorter catechism, man or humanity's chief end is to blank God and to blank him forever, Glorify and, uh, and, and, and enjoy, to enjoy him. him forever. Yeah. So those are some 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 good words to remember. Many folks have oh, uh, committed that to memory, and and that language yeah. of glorifying God uh, as the big, the first question in the in the catechism. That's also reflected in the very beginning of our own church's mission statement uh, to glorify God and make disciples who witness and serve. We kind of whoever did that in decades past kind of uh -huh. took the the beginning of the catechism and um, and part of the charge in the Great Commission and, and mesh those two together. I think it's a, a wonderful mission statement. But also, right, we talk a lot about glorifying God. Sometimes we forget about the enjoying part, right, that the life of faith is hard and strenuous, but it's also uh, enriching and joyful and, and light bringing, not just hard and heavy all the time. Uh, we talked about this already. What was the movement that the Declaration of Barman was written in response against? Nazism. Yeah, yeah. And according to... And the German Christian Church. Right. Yeah. I took that to be National Socialism, which is what it reads, which it is interesting Socialism. in our time. Yeah. 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 Well, right. So that was the, the name of the Nazi party, right? Was the National Socialist, yeah, Socialist. National Socialist yeah. Party. So according to Barman, uh, speaking of Nazis, uh, what is Barman strongly, it strong, strongly rejects ultimate power being given to either the blank or the blank. Church or state. Yeah, church or state, right? So often, um, I think we have people that, that land on one end or the other, right? We've got folks that are so worried about the church impinging on the state and other folks that are so worried about the state impinging on the church. But Barman reminds us that if Christ is Lord, Christ is Lord of all, then that means church and state should be freed to focus on their particular purviews and not try to use one another's power. But you're going to have this balance there. All right, uh, C67 asserts that the written word of God, the Bible, witnesses to the incarnate word of God, who is Jesus Christ. It also states the scriptures given under the guidance of blank are nevertheless the words of blank, conditioned by the language, thought forms, and literary fashions of the places and times in which they were written. What are those two blanks? The sc scriptures are given under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And they are nevertheless the words of men. Yeah. Or well, the PCA men. must yeah. hate that. Must hate that. Yeah. So they, yeah, they, they left before that was adopted into, yeah, yeah they're, they're by, right? So it's the, and, and really this is the acknowledgement of what the Bible itself actually says, right? Um, you never, so what you don't have in, uh, uh, 
throughout the course of most of Christian history, this, this idea of, of inerrancy um, or, or this uh, hyper-literalism, that really begins to creep up near the end of the 1800s um, with the, the rise of, of a number of different theological movements that kind of intersect to form fundamentalism. Um, prior to that, though, I mean, you had people that understood, yes, these are Paul's words, and they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so they point us to Christ and so we can say these are biblical, these are canonical, these are the word of God written. Not, it's not God or Paul. It's, it, it's, it's held together in, in, in unity. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, there are other views certainly out there, but by and large, you know, outside of, of fundamentalist Christians, um, we don't have this, this view of, you know, these humans who have no agency, you know, there's just this brain dump, you know, Holy Spirit opens your brain, inserts the words, and all Paul was, was, you know, dictating words that were told to be written exactly one way. Um, that would be, and I, I don't say this disparagingly, but that would be more of a, um, a standard viewpoint held by uh, Muslims in terms of the Quran, right, that there's a, a literal uh, direct translate or direct inspiration viewpoint there, um, but outside of, of fundamentalism, uh, the the more you know, nineteenth and twentieth century versions of fundamentalism, that's not been a traditional Christian viewpoint. Although now it's certainly um, has some loud adherents. Uh, the Confession sixty seven number fifteen draws distinction between God's gift of revelation and the human character of religion. It states, the Christian finds parallels between other religions and his own and must approach all religions with blank and blank. What are those two blanks? Openness and respect. Openness and respect. But the reconciling word of God of the gospel is God's judgment upon all forms of religion, including... Christian. The Christian. Yeah, Christianity, right? So that's that big difference, right? Don't conflate Christ and Christianity that they are not the same, one and the same. Christ is Lord, Christianity is not. Christianity is, can mess up, right? That's the whole point of the Reformation, was they said, the church has messed up. We got some changes that need, there, there's judgment that needs to, needs to be, be doled out uh, in, in, in reforming and refining. Um, and, and that was often, of course, met with, no, no, you know, the the hierarchy is the representation of Christ on earth. So you got to take what comes out of, you know, the Pope's mouth is equal to what Christ would have said if he was standing here. And, and throughout our, our reform tradition, we, of course, um, we, we, we don't like that kind of uh, uh, conflating of Christ and Christianity. Uh, what was the major social issue that led to the confession of Belhar? Parthide. Okay. And uh, that document says that we reject any doctrine which absolutizes either natural blank or the sinful blank of people. Diversity and separation. Yeah. So taking natural diversity and making that absolute, right? Uh, it doesn't deny diversity. It doesn't say, you know, that sort of colorblindness, for instance. It says, no, this is, this is natural diversity, but we don't absolutize that uh, in, and make it an idol that leads us to separate people based on that diversity, that that, that separation is sinful when it's imposed in such a way. All right, a uh, brief statement of faith uh, follows the same Trinitarian pattern, but uh, it, it shifts the order a little bit. What's the order that, of the Trinitarian pattern in a brief statement? Christ, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so we're used to, you know, first words, first lines of the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed, starting with God the Father, then the Son, then the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the, we didn't have time because we were rushing through uh, kind of survey of, of uh, history and theology, but briefly mentioned Karl Barth uh, earlier. One of the things that Karl Barth did in the middle of the 20th century. Again, he was the one who wrote the Declaration of, of Barman resisting Nazis, but he also taught well into the 60s. 
um, throughout Switzerland and Germany. Um, he is often referred to as a, a theologian of the word of God, that his huge emphasis was sort of returning the, the 20th century church to the, 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 the rich biblical witness and to the lordship of Christ, right? Christ is Lord. And so um, everything in Christian theology for him was read through the lens of, of who is Jesus, and even more specifically, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? So he would say, for instance, um, and he would lift up that, that, that you don't come to know God and then you get to Jesus. He said, no, in reality, you come to know God strongest and clearest through who Jesus Christ is. Or he would say, it's not that you, you, uh, you know, you, 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 he, he would, was big on all sorts of things, but it, sort of, we, we think lots of times, oh, you got to realize how bad you are and, 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 and how low you sink in your own sinfulness before you reach out and cry out for God's grace. And he would say, no, it's the reverse. He said, uh, uh, grace is being in right relationship with God. And if sin is broken relationship with God, you don't understand your sin apart from seeing it as broken relationship with God. So you got to be understand who God is in Christ before you, anyway, could go on and on and on about it. And I'm, I'm selling it short by trying to summarize, but that, that's not just a, oh, isn't it interesting that they reversed the order of one, number one and number two. That was an intentional theological move that I think reflects the, the sort of high Christology or, or strong emphasis on um, uh, the beginning questions of faith with who is Jesus Christ and what does Jesus Christ do and spilling out from there to answer other questions that Bart initiated and is still very much the case, I'd say, throughout, um, you know, the mainline reform tradition. A uh, brief statement of faith, we talked about this before, uh, calls blank and blank to all ministries of the church. What is that? Women and men. Yeah, so that they, they didn't pull any punches <laughs> there and say, nope, you know, we, we've got a, a history of, of inequality, but now in the, the 1990s, as we're, we're coming together, you know, this new church is affirming from the start this equality of call. And in that same paragraph about the, the Holy Spirit, it says the Spirit gives us courage to unmask idolatries in blank and blank. Church, church and culture. Yeah, so lots of times we like to talk about and think about those idolatries out there in culture. But this reminds us also that within the church, we can create and form our own idols just as strongly. So we're not, we're not better uh, at avoiding idols just because, you know, we've got a card-carrying member of Spring Hill Presbyterian. Um, all right, shifting then the Book of Order. It's divided into four parts. What are those four? We, we started with that last week. What are those four? Foundations, government, worship, discipline. Yeah. <clears throat> Who is the head of the church? I'm just, I was going to quickly say, right. you know, the, the book of order, the most recent one I have is 0709. Yeah. And there is no, there aren't three, there were only three parts. Right, right. At that point in time, we didn't do the foundations of, of policy. Polity were not in the book of orders. That was, so I had to scramble and get online. And Did you find, find the online? Okay, good. I was about to say, oh, yeah, you I got it online. Okay, because if you're using that one, then a lot of your answers are probably, Me too, probably looking through uh, citation and thinking, what is Buzz talking about? That's not what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> so back in 2010, um, the Book of Order received a uh, significant, went through a, a, a crash diet plan and, and was trimmed significantly. Um, it had been three sections, the G, the W, and the D section. What they did is they took the G section, the form of government, and they pulled out of it kind of the most important parts to create that foundation section. Okay. So like the historic principles of church order, the great ends of the church, we're talking about a little bit, a lot of that material, almost all of that was already in the, the G section, but it was kind of scattered and spread between multiple chapters. It wasn't all you know, held together. So they, they moved that F section out. And then what remained, they significantly trimmed it. So it, it was yeah. less uh, rules and procedures and more 
um, principles that need to be rem remembered as you, you, you make decisions. But that, that's, we talked about that. They said, we don't want, this is our constitution. We don't want it to become a policy manual. So they, they whittled out um, more policy manual kind of stuff and, and asked and empowered congregations and presbyteries to create their own policies that, that fit within the constitution. But yeah, that's right. So anything before 2000, I guess of the 2011 version, um, 11, 12, uh, it's going to, it's going to be different. And then even, you know what? 13s are too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So anything prior to that's going to be, yeah. if it doesn't have the F section, but I'm realizing we, we, um, yeah, we'll see if we're, if we're good. We, we may have bumped into a few other, uh, hiccups now that, I, cause I know they actually recently did a significant rewrite of the, um, directory for worship so some of those worship things well when we get to y'all tell me if you found it easy. as long as they kept jesus in there you know and the holy spirit <laughs> and God, yeah. I, i'm good ahead we're good we're good all right, all right. Uh, real brief one word this uh, it, it says that the book of confessions are are what kind of standards subordinate subordinate standards so they are still standards that we hold ourselves in the church to but they are subordinate standards, subordinate to the higher standard that is scripture, That's the Bible, true. right? So, so they, they were clear that they are not on par. Um, for um, official doctrine purposes in the Roman Catholic Church, going back for centuries, there's a strong emphasis on scripture and tradition, but they are held up as sort of uh, uh, equal parts, right? So there are important teachings and doctrines that scripture may not say anything about, but centuries of church tradition has taught that this is right and true, and therefore uh, they're held to be co-equals, uh, equal standards. Uh, we have said the reverse is, yes, we have teachings that developed throughout the centuries. Our confessions reflect those, but they are subordinate to scripture, that they're not considered to be equal. If we run into to, uh, conflict, we know which one has authority over the other. Okay, uh, some central, uh, the, the, the F section describes the central affirmation of the Reformed tradition as the sovereignty of God. And related to this affirmation are other great themes of the Reformed tradition. And uh, just briefly, what you don't have to read the full text of it, but what, what are those four themes that it lifts up? Election. Yeah, election. And it says, right, election for both service yes. and salvation, salvation, right? We talk all the time about chosen or elect or predestined for what happens after we die. But in truth, it's just as much chosen, elected, predestined for the work we're called to do here and now. Yeah. What are the other three? Covenant life marked by a discipline concerned for order in the church according to the word of God. Yeah. Faithful stewardship. Yeah, stewardship. Stewardship, not just financial stewardship, is it? Right. No. no. Seeks proper use of the gifts of God's creation. Yeah. And all, of, all of life creation. and all of creation. Yeah. And stewardship that shuns ostentation. And then there's that one, what's the, the, the other theme? Transformation. Yeah. All right. Uh, we talked about this last week. What year were the historic principles of church order written? 1789. Yeah. Wait, I got 88. I got 88 too. Yeah. I got 89. So. I got 88. <laughs> I must be wrong then. No, no, you're I good. Know. You're, you're here. Let's let's pull up the footnote. That's where I was looking. Oh, it's the only place to find it. It was a trick. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so this was kind of a trick question. So here's what happens, right? You see in the footnote, 1788, these words were written by the Synod of New York and Philadelphia. The next year was the first year that multiple presbyteries and synods gathered for the general assembly 
of the nationwide Presbyterian Church USA. And the, in that first meeting, they affirmed at the national level in 1789, these words that had been written by a regional governing body the year before. So both, I'll, I'll accept both answers as valid because uh, two different levels of government that, but yes, yeah, there are a few places where, where the answer was hidden in footnotes. Good. Oh, I said, I didn't read far enough. I was skimming. Didn't no, read. you're good. You're good. Uh, according to that first, historic principle of church order. God alone is Lord of the conscience. Therefore, we consider the rights of blank in all matters that respect religion as universal and inalienable. Rights of private judgment. Private judgment. judgment. Yep. Yep. So freedom of the conscience is how we might say that now. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this also last week. According to the, another historic principle, blank is in order to blank. Truth, truth to goodness. To goodness. Yeah, truth is in order to goodness, or there's an inseparable connection between faith and practice, between truth and duty, mm -hmm. right? So we've said this before, if it matters, then it should impact how we act and live and decisions we make. Um, we talked about this a lot as well. Uh, uh, we think it the, the duty of private Christians and societies to exercise blank toward each other. Mutual forbearance. forbearance. Yeah, mutual forbearance. Um, there's another old section of the, the, the book, the Presby Principles of Presbyterian Government. When were they written? 1797. Yeah, so they're brand new, right? They're, they're not old <laughs> like the 1780s. They're, they're these <laughs> newer ones from the 1790s, yeah. But it lays out some other sort of basic building blocks for, for our pattern of government. Uh, the church shall be governed by presbyters, that is, blank elders and blank elders. Ruling and teaching. teaching. Yep. Oh, I have sleeping and singing. I need to fix that. Good. <laughs> right. So in, in our congregation, um, Anna and I are teaching elders, and everyone who serves on the session is a ruling elder. We'll talk a little bit more at the end of this uh, about some of that. Uh, uh, the, another part of uh, number 39, uh, presbyters are gathered together into church councils, formerly called judicatories or governing bodies. What are the four kinds of councils in the PCUSA? Sessions, presbyteries, synods, and general assembly. Yep. All right. What are the three ways you can become a member of the church? Three ways to enter into active membership. Public confession of faith. Uh, certificate or letter of transfer. And then reaffirmation of faith. Yep. So the short, or what that means is, right, either you're joining for the first time, which is what, for instance, confirmation is. They make a public profession of faith. Um, that doesn't have any age restrictions on it, but we've had, we've had folks who've joined our church. Um, this is the first time they've been members of a church uh, in their life as, as adults, grown adults. And so they, they, they're joining and professing their faith from the start. Transfer means you already did that in another church and you've, you've moved and so you're transferring. And then reaffirmation is the, you know, well, I was a member and then I kind of stopped going and I wasn't connected to any church for a while and now I'm coming back. Um, when you have someone who was not baptized prior, um, often would, that would be like as an infant, um, it's that first time reaffirmation, or the, or the first one, the, the public profession of faith, that's when we would also baptize someone if they hadn't been baptized before. All right, there are only, and this is, I want to make sure that this is correct, this might have gotten tweaked a little bit since the last time I updated the um, document. All right, according to the G section, there are only six items of business that can be transacted at a congregational meeting. What are those? Elect the elders, deacons, and trustees. Yeah. Call the pastor, associate pastor. Mm -hmm. Change pastoral relationships. Is that firing somebody? Yeah, firing somebody oh. or um, like 
tech, like giving somebody a raise technically, okay. like you're changing the relationship okay. from what it's formerly been okay. before. Yeah. Buy mortgage or sell real property. Yeah. What else? Request the presbytery to grant an exemption. As permitted in the constitution. Okay. Well, I think we did that when we started Stephen Ministry because we took uh, we had to have a special exemption to take communion to outside the church, and we had for us to do it. Yeah, so that's an instance where you might have that. Uh, other times that we see that usually is for small churches, right? So uh, it's one of the rules is that elders serve for a three-year term, and you can't be an elder more than six years in a row. So you can be elected, and then you can be elected a second time, but you. No more three year term, no more than six years in a row. Um, so there are some tiny churches that that's all they can do to get three people on their session. And so they, they're, they're small churches that have requested and are, are always often granted an exception from that so that they may have longer terms of service, for instance, um, because it fits their needs of their particular community. Yeah. And then that last one is approving uh, the creation of a, a joint congregational witness or dissolving one of those. So that would be uh, two churches joining together. Um, the congregation needs to vote on that. So here's the thing. So, so this is important to remember as, as, um, for all of us, but especially as elders, that um, everything else that's on there or everything else that you think of that's really important that we might do, um, it doesn't come, it, it's the responsibility of the session to be the elected governing body to handle these matters. So sometimes, especially maybe if we have a uh, background or experience in the Baptist church, where there's more uh, frequent use of congregational meetings to decide important matters, uh, sometimes that, that can feel a little odd or, or not as, as transparent. You think, well, oh, you know, we got a big decision coming up. Um, are we gonna, um, you know, are we gonna tear down the sanctuary and we're going to build a, a, a bowling alley instead, right? That's a, that'd be a pretty big decision. You would want to informally have gathered as much feedback and information from the congregation as you can. But technically, unless you're doing one of these six things, the congregation doesn't vote on it. Not just that they don't have to, but they're not allowed to also. So, so a congregational vote on something other than these six items is technically uh, should be ruled out of order, right? Um, you'll see this when we talk about this often. Um, I can't remember if it's in this uh, or not, but um, it's, it's the responsibility of the session every year to present the budget to the congregation. But we present a budget that the session has already voted on and approved we don't bring it to the congregation for a vote. Um, similar, right? We don't take to, you know, the entire, you know, voting public. When we go in the poll booth in, in, in November, or if we've done early voting, we don't vote on tax code, usually. You know, we don't vote on, on you know, details related to the national parks. We don't vote on, right? We, we, we don't vote on, on Supreme Court nominees, right? Uh, we have representative government that is empowered and entrusted to represent us and to make decisions. The same is the case in our congregational pattern as well. So, um, you know, hiring and firing of staff that are not ordained and installed ministers is session decision, not congregation decision. Um, um, this came up and it, I mean, it wasn't, we, we were wide open and transparent, but you know, Harvey was part of this, this, um, as we launched into the capital campaign, we realized we needed to take out a loan to pay for the air conditioning. And we knew that we would have enough pledges coming in over five years to pay that loan off. But the question is, do we need to take this to the congregation for a vote? A and the answer was since the loan wasn't requiring us to put up the property as collateral, then it's not up for a congregational vote. If we needed to mortgage the property, then yes, the session can't do that without a congregational vote. But if a congregational vote is not needed, then it's also out of order. So it's very particular. We, 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 
nobody loves clear lines of, of checks and balances more than Presbyterians do. And so we, we have it all laid out pretty clear there. Hey Buzz, I got a question about yeah. number six, the answer on that. Is that referring to just a joint congregational witness to Presbyterian churches or like in the Spring Hill community, if you decide that you're gonna do something jointly with the Baptist church, is that also what it's talking about or? Yeah, when it uses the word witness, it, in this instance, it means congregation, right? So if we decided we wanted to merge Spring Hill and Government Street Pres into one congregation, um, the, the congregation at both, both congregations would have to vote on that. So too, if we decided we wanted to merge Spring Hill Pres and Spring Hill Baptist or Spring Hill Methodist, uh, the, the con well, we don't have Spring Hill Methodist, but we, we, the congregation would have to vote on essentially uh, uniting is sort of a, a form or a version of legally dissolving as well, right? So you're no longer, you, you've merged legally. And so that requires the, the vote of the whole group. But yeah, if we decide, you know, we're, we're going to sponsor a car wash to raise money for international missionaries, and we're going to do it with, you know, St. Ignatius and St. Paul's. Uh, no, that, that, you could say that is a, that's a joint congregational witness, but that's not what this is talking about. Okay. It just means merging congregations, joining congregations. And you have some places, um, some, some places, for instance, in New England and other places in, in, the, um, the, uh, in the West where you might have had, you know, uh, especially with congregationalist churches, many of which today are, are part of the, the UCC, where, you know, out in the frontier, small UCC church, small PCUSA church, that over time have gotten smaller and smaller and said, well, we can't continue to function separately, but if we merge together, we can, but we don't want to stop being UCC and we don't want to stop being PCUSA, so we merge together and we're both. So you, you see some of that happening. Mm -hmm. But again, the session can't just decide, right? You, you don't open your church newsletter and read, the church session has decided we are merging our congregation with Spring Hill Baptist you know, deal with it. That, that's not how, um, that's not how we operate. Okay, uh, question 34, according to that section that's cited, um, blank are called to the ministries of compassion, witness, and service. Deacons. Yeah, and their ministry is under the supervision and authority of? Session. Session, Session. right? So technically, um, one of those groups oversees the other officially. All right, uh, according to this other section, who are called to the Ministry of Discernment and Governance? Elders. Yes, yeah. or specifically ruling elders in this case, yeah. Uh, when they're elected to co as commissioners to higher church councils, who has more authority? Ministers of Word and Sacrament or ruling elders? The same. Yeah, um, yeah. Neither. neither one has more authority, they're the same, right? So um, when we gather at, uh, presbytery meeting, for instance, there are an equal number of teaching elders, ministers, and ruling elders at the synod, at the general assembly. It's an equal number. Um, unlike some of our other uh, uh, denominations, the, going to seminary and being ordained as a, a pastor or minister doesn't give you higher authority in the formal structure, organizational pattern of our our church. And that's one of the things that really I do think makes makes us distinct and sets us apart in some powerful ways. Uh, according, question 36, according to that cited portion, uh, do ministers of word and sacrament have membership in the presbytery or the congregation? Presbytery. Yeah, so this is a piece where it's a little bit weird. So, so mm -hmm. I'm not a member of Spring Hill Pres, but my wife, Ryan, is. And when Loie goes through confirmation, she will be. Um, and, and even in retirement, right? So Billy McLean, as a retired minister, is not a member of Spring Hill Prez, but his wife, Sue, is. So um, Billy can't be asked to serve on the church session because he's not a member of this church. Um, Sue has been an elder multiple times. Um, 
if there's a, a congregational vote that comes up, Billy doesn't have a vote in a congregational meeting, neither do I, neither do Anna, um, because we're technically not members of the congregation. Uh, all right, the cited section in question 37 says, the session of the congregation shall be composed of those persons elected by the congregation to active service as blank, Ruling elders. ruling elders, right? Active service as ruling elders, together with installed blank and blank. Pastors, pastors, and, associate pastors associate. and associate pastors, all of whom are entitled to a vote. So that's important to remember as well, That and we, we, we try to model that well at, in our congregation, in our session. Um, so I have a vote on the session, and Anna, as an installed associate pastor, does as well. Uh, not all Presbyterian churches even model that uh, or, or, or use that, but that's important to remember too, if you're going on the session, um, because my, I'm the moderator in that chair kind of role. Um, I usually don't exercise my vote. Um, my, my thought being that I, I, I will exercise it in the event of a tie if need be, but um, otherwise I, I tend to not vote as the, the moderator. Um, the, on the, the other side, Anna most of the time does vote because she's, she's in a different functional role there. So, um, so both are entitled to a vote. And so every now and then, not here, but, um, but I've, I've heard at other churches where that's really become an issue, right? When it comes down to, to voting on something. So there's um, a time in the history of our church that we remembered uh, back last year for our 75th anniversary, a time where the session took a controversial stance um, that, or there was a controversial matter uh, that our church wanted to weigh in on writing a letter to the, 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 the national office of the Southern Presbyterian Church, disagreeing with um, some decisions and some stances it had made uh, with regard to a few civil rights issues. So um, the church session put a committee together. They wrote a, a, uh, uh, they wrote a letter, a draft letter. Not everybody on the committee agreed with that. They had a, a minority report that wrote, wrote an alternate letter. They brought both, this was in the, in the uh, 60s. They brought both letters to the church session. David Eddington was the pastor at the time. Um, and David disagreed with the majority report. And he was in favor of the minority report. It comes before the session, they vote on it. And by one vote, the majority report won. The, that was a little bit, you, in today's language, we would say more conservative on this civil rights issue. The minority report did not win, but Dave Eddington, you know, made sure it was recorded in the minutes that he voted with the losing side, which I think is fascinating in a number of ways. We see, we see our Presbyterian poly at work the other is he continued to serve as he had been the pastor here for a decade and he continued to serve for another decade after that, right? So here's this, you know, critical, pivotal time, potentially divisive issue, not all the sessions on the same page, the pastor sides with, with the minority, not the majority, and it's not the end of civilization, right? It's, it's polity working its way, way out. Okay. Um, we already talked about this, the uh, question 80, uh, six, the th 38, that the budget's approved by the session, not the congregation. 39, uh, blank is the council of the whole church and representative of the unity of synods, presbytery sessions, and congregations of the PCUSA. What is that? General assembly. General assembly. Yeah. Uh, this is an important one. Uh, all property held by a congregation is technically considered to be held, what? In trust. In trust. In trust, right? So that, or the technical word for that is our property is not our own um, by being PCUSA. So when questions have come up in the past with other congregations that have uh, left the PCUSA, sometimes that's the first time their session is reminded that they don't own their own property um, because they, when they vote to leave, they think they, they, they take it with them. That's why I, I always make sure that this is something that is covered. So we don't ever get surprised. I hope that's not a conversation we would need to have, but um, that we don't get surprised by that. So, um, so when you do see, so for instance, here in Mobile, we've had uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church uh, and, and Overlook Presbyterian Church that have both left in the last decade or so. Um, both of those churches request, vote, 
requested that the presbytery dismiss them and requested that they be able to keep their property. And the presbytery negotiated essentially like a severance package. The, the presbytery negotiated terms that you can take your property, but we're going to, in order to do so and to free you to do so, we're going to require you to pay X amount towards the mission of this presbytery. So, so um, that's, that's an important just piece and thing to remember. Some of these new denominations that have formed up in recent decades don't have this clause in there. They're, they want to make sure from the start that congregations have their own property. So if they don't like what's happening in this new split off church, they can split off again even more easily and, 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 and keep going further and further down. So um, different approaches, different, different starting points and assumptions. Certainly in a big public way, of course, uh, a lot of y'all may remember similar language that the Episcopal Church has as the debate around Christ Church in downtown Mobile that happened um, a couple decades ago was, was around a similar kind of, of situation. Okay. Uh, How did that work when uh, we joined the uh, PCUSA? At that point, they didn't own that property, but just by us joining them, they did? Yeah, so they actually, there was, there was a, um, right, so in the Southern Presbyterian Church before reunion, um, most, if not all, congregations owned their own property, but they were entering into this new body, and so there was a, um, there was this, like, grace period where as the denomination was coming together, they, they let the old stipulation exist for a period of time so if churches basically if you had so what really happened it was you had some southern churches who owned their own property they we merged with the northern church to form the peace usa and you had some southern conservative churches that wanted to leave and go pca some left before reunion but some left after reunion and there was basically a a period a window of time you could leave within that window and take your property with you as the old rules had said. But um, there's probably, there's some more detailed legalese to that that I'm, I'm not as brushed up on, thankfully, because I haven't had to be. But, um, um, but that's, I think, the short answer to that. Okay, uh, this is another important one that I, I make sure we, we list all the time, right? According to this cited section, who is mandated or who's uh, the language is, is, is your know, mandatory reporter? Who's mandated to report knowledge of the abuse of a minor to church and civil authorities? Any I member remember. engaged in ordered ministry. Yeah, any member that is in, engaged in ordered ministry. Uh, which is which is the technical language for ordained, right? So that means anyone who is an elder or a deacon, right? So in the state of Alabama, you're not legally required to be a mandatory reporter just by virtue of serving as a deacon or an elder at your church. If you're not in, in particular positions related to children, um, as like teachers, for instance, would be, but in our church, we hold ourselves in the PCUSA to a higher standard that, that we are all considered mandatory reporters. And so um, this is one of the reasons that we, we go through a few of these particular details to make sure you all know it. So by virtue of becoming an, an, uh, an elder or a deacon, you become a mandatory reporter. So if there's ever anything that comes up at the church uh, that you think is, is uh, worthy of needing to be reported, um, a, the, the question is, do I really need to tell the authorities or do, will someone else? The answer is yes, you need to. And the two, certainly call me and we'll walk through what that process looks like on both the church side and the state side, okay? You also said something about any certified Christian educator employed by the church. Right, right. So that would, we don't have a certified Christian educator here. Uh, that's, that's what Andrea Hall was before she left. Um, but we replaced her position with an ordained minister. So that's Anna and I. We both fall into that category of. Um, mm -hmm. So it's basically saying, you know, church employees who who are overall over Christian education 
are included, even if they're not ordained as an elder or a deacon. Okay. Uh, we talked about this before. What's more difficult to amend, the Book of Confessions or the Book of Order? Confessions. Yeah, it requires supermajority and two general assemblies and all that. All right. Um, First time I went through this, I, I put the Book of Order, and then I went back through it, reviewing everything, and I said, no, no, no I think it might be the <laughs> Book of Confessions. So. Yeah, yeah. Be good. Neither one is a walk in the park. No. Yeah. Well, but as well, difficult as it is to amend the Book of Order, it happens every two years when the General Assembly meets. That's why, you know, these these have dates on them because two years from now, this is not going to. There will be changes. It's sort of constantly a work in process. So, um, okay. Um, okay. Um, according to the worship section. Christian worship has always been marked by a tension between blank and blank. Form and freedom. Yeah, form and freedom. We talked a lot about that when we talked about, you know, not having a formal prayer book, but having guidance. All right, this is sort of a, the fun one, all right? From these sections, who is responsible for which of the following? All right, who's responsible for providing for the celebration of sacraments? Session or Jesus. pastor? Jesus. To answer all these was Jesus, wasn't it? That's right, that's right. That's always the answer in church. <laughs> so I said session here. Yes, session is responsible for providing for the celebration of sacraments. We don't ha celebrate communion here without the session approving it. Right. Um, who's in charge of the music to be sung, session or pastor? Pastor. Pastor. Yeah, uh, in consultation with church musicians, but yes, pastor. Uh, right? So th it's, these to me are always fun to imagine, right? You only have rules because there's been an issue that's resulted mm -hmm. in needing to write a rule, right? So at some point, enough churches had, obviously, it had issues where the session didn't like music that was being sung and wanted to tell the pastor and the musician what they could and couldn't sing, and you had to, you had to delineate uh, authority and responsibility. And so, um, so here we have, you know, uh, all right? The authority for the use of special appointments, such as flowers, candles, manners, pyramids, and other objects of art. <coughs> Who's that? Session or pastor? That's the session. Right. Yeah. That's so where we have all those committees. Right. So we, we don't like flower committee. Right. You, we, we don't like the flower stand. So, you know, and, and we get right. Yeah. All right. Uh, authority over the space where worship is conducted. Session. Yep. The selection of scripture lessons to be read, session or pastor? Pastor. pastor. Yeah, so you can't say, uh, as the session, we hate the story of Noah's Ark and we're prohibiting Buzz from ever preaching on it, right? We, we, we don't <laughs> go that way, right? Uh, who determines the times, occasions, days, and places for worship, session or pastor? session yeah so the session is response so when we decided we were gonna for instance uh uh change the time for our christmas eve services um and make them a little bit earlier um that was a session decision came through the worship committee um the particular prayers that are offered session or pastor pastor i yeah. say both well, so the session doesn't have authority over what prayers are said. Okay. Right? They're, they're, they are, uh, of course, encouraged to participate, but when it comes to... Isn't there like, something about corporate prayer, though, under the session? Yeah, in terms of uh, that it's appropriate for elders to lead corporate prayers. Okay. So that's an appropriate use of, of, of ordained leaders in worship, but they're not, you know, the session can't say, we don't like that prayer of confession or you have to start including this phrase in every prayer that you say, things like okay. that. That's that, that delineated authority. This one, the one about music to be sung is always interesting. So it's not on here, but I guess technically it counts as part of, well, I'm not sure what it is, special appointments or something else. But so pastors in consultation with musicians are, are ultimately responsible for what music is sung, but the session is the one who, who has authority over what hymnals are in the room. 
right? Mm. So that's a place where sometimes you get that kind of give and take and put, you know, we don't like this, but we can't tell you not to. So here's the new hymnal that we've all approved you have to use. And oh, look, it doesn't include that hymn that we all hate. So, um, <laughs> so there's, there's, there's some ways to, to kind of navigate tactfully through this. All right. Uh, according to the directory for worship, um, it doesn't require a particular order, right? So there's not only one way that Presbyterians can structure and order their service, but it does provide some suggested order that's rooted in three sources. What are those three sources? Scripture. Yep, scripture. Traditions of the universal church. Yeah. Reformed, reformed heritage. Reformed and the reformed heritage, heritage right? So the, the order of worship, the flow of our service, gathering around the word, proclaiming the word, uh, responding to the word and following the word out in the world, those, those are, come from these sources. All right, this order seeks to uphold the centrality of what? Word, word and sacraments. Yeah, word and sacraments. Word and that's, sacraments. that's at the heart of our worship. Uh, how many times can somebody be baptized? One time, that's right, one time. Um, you will see occasionally when someone, uh, where we will, will have a service of remembering or reaffirming your baptism, but we don't rebaptize people. Uh, who authorizes the celebration of the Lord's Supper? Session. Session, Session. right? Session. So that means we can't just say, you know, hey, we just had this wonderful retreat, and at the very end, wouldn't it be nice if we had communion right now? Um, sometimes functionally that might be a great idea, but our polity doesn't want us to be um, kind of quick and flippant about when we celebrate the Lord's Supper for a number of reasons. One of those is we don't um, we don't want to have communion at times or in ways that exclude or preclude people from from being part of um, of participating in it. So uh, this is not a big, a big deal. There's ways to do it, but one of the, the uh, I know a number of churches that don't allow communion to be served at a wedding because the assumption is a wedding is an invitation only worship service. And so since not everyone is invited, you shouldn't celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, on the other hand, some have said you can celebrate the Lord's Supper at a wedding if you invite the entire congregation to come. And so some churches will do that. They'll include, you know, in the newsletter, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so are getting married. The sacrament will be celebrated. Anyone is welcome to come. Um, so this, of course, grows out of a, a old uh, um, reformed historical baggage around private communion that was a big deal uh, in, in the medieval era of, um, you know, I'm going to pay the priest to come to my house and, and just give me private communion. Uh, we do celebrate communion um, for folks who can't come to church, but we're real clear in our language there that we aren't uh, celebrating the sacrament anew in that moment, but we are extending communion that has already happened in the sanctuary. And as soon as it's convenient to do so, we're taking that extended communion that was celebrated corporately to folks who weren't able to be there. Just like if someone was on the front steps of the church while we we're having the Lord's Supper, you'd take them the bread and the, and the, and the cup out there. We're just taking it a little bit further. Um, and sometimes there's a delay of time because of that. Uh, the constitutional questions for ordination. What's that citation? 4.0. Okay. Yep. So I asked that because the, at the end of this process, those are the questions that you'll be asked in front of the church. These, you know, I do, I do, I will kind of questions. So I think it's important for you to know where they are so you can review them before you're asked them. Uh, the rules of discipline are the church's judicial process to address and correct wrongdoing in a manner that honors God. While the details of the process are fully described in its, in its pages, the biblical duty of church people to blank is not abated or diminished is what the quote says. So the biblical duty to do what? Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court. Yep. So in other words, because we have rules for how to solve issues, 
that doesn't mean that they have to be the first thing you jump to, right? So if you have, uh, uh, if, if a church has an issue with the situation, hopefully you, re, you can resolve those peacefully and in you know, normal dialogue with each other. If not, then we have this whole discipline section to resolve it, right? Um, the judicial process consists of two types of cases, or uh, what are those? Remedial and disciplinary. Yeah, remedial and disciplinary. Disciplinary are uh, when somebody messes up and, and needs to um, be dealt with a wrongdoing situation. That's what disciplinary is. Remedial is um, more when a church does something it's not supposed to do. Um, usually this is against, uh, uh, these are filed against congregations or sessions or presbyteries <laughs> when they do something out of order, right? So let's say... Um, you know, the, the uh, let's say a, somebody was upset because the session of Spring Hill Prez um, took the budget to the congregation to be voted on, right? So they did something that was out of order or they did something that was unconstitutional. How do you go back and fix that after the fact? You file a remedial case and you go back and un undo uh, something that was done wrong, um, holiday-wise, okay. All right, bonus question. How many appendices did you find to the Book of Order? Four. 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 All right, good deal. Fun. Wow, see, now my old one had six. Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were more in there. That was part of, part of what they trimmed. They had some old stuff that didn't matter as much anymore. All right, so uh, I'm so glad. So that, Was that an ecclesiastical appendectomy? Yeah, yeah. They removed those appendices, so that would be it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Oh, that's a, that that pun is just about ten years too old to be used uh, in 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 a uh, Presbyterian meeting. So, um, so that went. Uh, thank y'all. That went longer than I thought, uh, and that's okay. Um, what I thought we were going to conclude with, we'll just start with next week. So this was, I hope, for you a good review um, of matters, and that's the way it was intended and instruct, instructed to to be. Right, not just test you on what you can find and how quickly. This isn't like Presbyterian sword drills with the Book of Order, but this is um, ways to, to kind of be reminded together of some of the really important stuff that's in there in the Book of Confessions and the Book of Order. Um, any questions you have from things we talked about today, we reviewed, um, or anything new that maybe you didn't know that was uh, really important? That, that you wouldn't have known had you not gone through with a little bit finer tooth comb to find? Sometimes for uh, Congress, right, that, that, that part about session versus pastor who's responsible in worship, sometimes that can be some new information, not because people thought one thing um, so much as a, uh, it's, it's just new, you know, oh, I hadn't thought about that before, right? But, but in the event of a conflict, that can be helpful. And it's also uh, many times it's new because it's, it's new language. It's been added uh, just within the last five or six years um, is the broadening of who we consider to be included in the mandatory reporting category. So I think that's also um, maybe some new, um, you know, new realization for folks. Well, thanks for letting me keep you a little bit longer um, so we could review that and um, We'll jump in to next week. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, uh, but we're, I'll, I'll send you an email with details and homework. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the great ends of the church, which are part of the, uh, the, the F section. Uh, there's six sort of priorities or important um, reasons that we would affirm that the church exists. And um, my I mean, that's not just me, there's others who've said this as well, but, but kind of my particular take on it, of how uh, each of those different ends of the church tend to line up more or less with sort of our own assumptions and our own passions and energies. And so to kind of check in on, on what all six of those are, where we might fall personally and where others fall, because we're um, moving forward, we're going to be focusing more on who we are as Spring Hill Prez, but also specifically who are we as elders on this team um, this diverse team that's elders and deacons 
uh, with, with our own experiences and, and energies and passions and gifts to share together. So, uh, so I'll send an email out with homework for folks, but it won't be super heavy lifting, don't worry. All right, thanks everybody. And I'll see you again you. next Wednesday at noon. Same link, same password if you're prompted for it. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you, boss. Thank you, boss. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.